As I said last month, we looked at the opening chapter of this book, and we had three points then, for those who don't remember, and for those who were not here. First, you can trust God's word. Second, you have a great God. Third, you are part of a bigger story. God's calling out his people to worship and serve him. This morning I want to show you that you have a part to play. God's people are central to his purpose. When you look at chapter 1 and verse 3, the command that is given, or the invitation that's given, who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. The decree is issued to all the Jews, not to some individual. Not to Sheshbazza, not to Zerubbabel, not to Jeshua. The task of building the house of God is delegated by Cyrus to God's people as a whole, not just to one leader. And that's one of the main points of the book of Ezra. We give a misleading impression when we talk about it as the book of Ezra, or Nehemiah, the second part of it. Ezra doesn't enter the story for another 80 years. But the title shapes our thinking. It focuses our attention on the leader. Where the attention should really be on the people as a whole. I sometimes hear people speaking disparagingly of reformed churches as being a one-man ministry. Because of the prominence that's given to the preaching of God's word. That's usually a caricature. It's true, recent years have brought highly publicised allegations of abuses of power by those in leadership. And sadly, some of those allegations of bullying or predatory behaviour or over-controlling activities have been true. I recall one acquaintance of mine moving to a new church said his people were scared to say anything, to offer any opinion. Because the previous pastor brooked no dissent from his decisions. But that's not the norm. Church members are not just passive spectators, filling the pews, paying the bills, while that one man is all important. What we see in this passage is the importance of the people of God as a whole, and of the individuals that make up that whole. As Gregory Goswell says, Ezra 2 brings to centre stage the main character of Ezra and Nehemiah, namely the cast of thousands that made up the people who returned to build the house of God. This book is about them, about what ordinary men and women can do when God is motivating them. God loves ordinary believers, and he loves to use them. At that point he references 1 Corinthians 1, 26. You see your calling, brethren. There are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. He goes on of the 42,360 people of this chapter. Not all are even named. And yet this story is their story. The tomb of Cyrus can still be seen today. Pasagada in Iran. Built of huge limestone blocks. United with iron ties. The heroes and heroines of Ezra and Nehemiah have no monument except this book. If we think of the thousands, millions of believers who make up the 20 centuries of church history, not many of them have biographies written about them. Not many have monuments to their memory. But God has not forgotten what he did through them. Yes, there were leaders. In chapter 2, verse 2 lists them. You may think you recognise a couple of the names, actually, they're different people. It's not the Nehemiah we know. It's not the Mordecai of the book of Esther. They just have the same names. 
just as a Google search for Paul Gibson will highlight quite a diversity of people who share the name of the Free Church Minister here in Perth. Come to that, there are over 900 professionals called Mike Miles on LinkedIn. <laughs> The list here begins with Zerubbabel and Jeshua, the names you'll also find in Haggai and Zechariah. Zerubbabel's a descendant of King David, an ancestor of Jesus. But this book never mentions the fact he's a descendant of David. But it's not intending to highlight the individual and his importance. Usually he is linked with Jeshua. In the same way the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, are mentioned together. No one leader is given too much prominence. It celebrates the contribution of ordinary people. Now Zechariah 4 and 9 says, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of his temple, this temple. His hands shall also finish it. When you come in chapter 6 of Ezra to read about that completion of the temple, Zerubbabel isn't even mentioned. Just the elders of the Jews built, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, and they built and finished. <clears throat> so we see the principle here, that it's a whole people. You see that again in the last verse of the chapter. <clears throat> Notice what it says at the last verse <coughs> describes them as <coughs> some of the people and, and all Israel that's it dwelt in their cities all Israel and interesting that as well isn't it there are perhaps three tribes represented here Judah <coughs> Benjamin is it Benjamin that's part within Judah and Levi it's all Israel. It represents the whole people of God in principle. Well, this list of names and numbers, which I'm sure you were absolutely thrilled as I went through, <laughs> makes several points. One's the air of precision, isn't it? You even know how many donkeys they had. It's not a story made up years later. It's reported by someone who was there, someone who knew the details. Maybe there's a rebuke there to our age of indifference to accuracy. As Don Carson says, our age is so committed to vague feelings that precision in matters divine is often despised. We want to follow our intuitions, not our instructions. We elevate feelings, not facts. We ingest treacle, not truth. And then there's also a sense of approval, isn't there? Many of the Jews never returned to Judah. They had little interest in restoring the temple and the worship of God. To quote Don Carson again, their names have been lost. They are of little consequence in the sweep of redemptive history. But these names are remembered and written down in sacred scripture. Read them slowly. They call forth our respect and gratitude. If you like, this is the hall of fame. Derek Thomas, St. Titus' chapter on this section, pilgrims have names. Another commentator makes the same point. The return from the Babylonics is not an abstract concept. It can be seen in the faces of those who return, just as there's a God behind the return promise. So there are people who are named and seen as the face of the return fulfillment. Today's Christian leader must always be mindful of God's faithfulness but also that the people whom we serve have names and faces. We're not called to serve numbers, but needy people. We're not called to minister to statistics, but to saints. When you think about this, this is rather like a church record book, isn't it? After a generation or two, how many of the names in that book will be remembered? That doesn't matter. God remembers them all. What matters is that each of us in our time play our own part in God's kingdom. 
verse 64 tells the whole congregation together. There's 42,360. But you feel like adding up all the numbers in the previous verses. You get a much lower number, about 11,000 fewer. And there are various possible explanations of that. I won't go into them all. One's a suggestion that the total includes the women. And if that's so, then men outnumbered women by about three to one. And maybe that wouldn't be too surprising given the nature of the task. It could well be the majority of those who returned were young, unmarried men. And that in turn might explain the problem that arises later in the book with Jewish men marrying foreign women. Well, God knows the names of each of his people. That's an encouragement to us, isn't it? When we feel small and insignificant, God knows. And the next thing to note is that our roles are very varied. You see that in this list. There are priests and Levites, singers, gatekeepers, temple servants and so on. Some are prominent, some are humble. In some cases we aren't really sure what their role was. But each has his place. And it's the same in the church. Some people are in the spotlight like the preacher. Others work quietly behind the scenes in ministries of compassion or practical service. Some have offices and titles. Others just wear the label of ordinary church member. But whether you're leading the church or cleaning the building, all must be seen as service to God. As Dan ever says, bad sermons in the pulpit and cobwebs in the pews are both a disgrace to the Lord. So if you notice what's missing from this list, these people are planning to rebuild the temple. What kind of jobs will that entail? Stonemasons, carpenters, weavers, metal workers. None of those are mentioned. Why do you think that is? It's not because they aren't needed. It's because the focus is not on building a building as a building. It's on what it is there for. The jobs that are listed here are the ones that are needed once the elf temple's up and running. The ones that play a part in the worship of God. That's the focus, that God may be worshipped. And there are the variety of roles in that. And the New Testament likewise shows us a variety of roles and gifts, doesn't it? Incidentally, if you think about in terms of strength and weakness, as you read through that list of numbers, there are some huge numbers, weren't there? Over a thousand others when there's just some double figures. They weren't all the same. And neither of it's in the church. Gifts vary, roles vary as well. There are various lists of gifts in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 12, for example, Paul lists several of them. He says, all are given for the common good. He uses the analogy of a body, many parts, all working together. One part can't say it doesn't need the others. And neither can any part consider itself to be useless. The folk can't say, oh, I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, even if the hand does seem more important. God's intention is that there may be no division in the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. The fascinating chapter in Arnold Dalimore's biography of C.H. Spurgeon entitled Daily Life in the Great Church. Do you ever think of Spurgeon as just a great preacher? Do you think of the tabernacle as a preaching station where people flock from all over London to hear the great preacher? It's not just a preaching station. In fact, seven days a week, that building was opened at seven in the morning. It didn't close until eleven at night. At the time of Spurgeon's Jubilee, no fewer than 66 institutions 
were connected to the tabernacle. Some were directly spiritual, some were educational, some met social needs. And then there were all the mission works, the ragged schools, the Sunday schools and so on, run by people from the tabernacle. There's a huge variety of work going on, an equally huge variety of gifts and talents needed all put to use in God's service in the different ways. There's a variety of roles and gifts. And then one of the ways that we serve is through our giving. You see at the end of the chapter that account of the heads of the father's houses offering for the work of God there. And there are lessons here for us. First, their giving was generous. When it talks about this uh, <clears throat> 61,000 gold drachmas, 5,000 minas on silver, we're talking about half a metric tonne of gold, almost three tonnes of silver. We learn from Ezra 6 4 that Cyrus intended the cost of rebuilding the temple to be paid from the royal treasury people want to play their part. And that's a New Testament principle as well. In 2 Corinthians 9, Paul gives advice on giving. He says that he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. What you get out of the ground is directly related to what you put in it. If I go up to my allotment with a packet of seeds and I put two or three of them in the ground, I won't get much of a crop. I get much of a crop if I don't go and deal with some of the weeds. <clears throat> the farmer doesn't grudge the seed he puts into the ground. It's an investment for the future, not a loss. And the same is regarding giving. If our attitude is one of how little can I get away with, we'll receive a small return. We won't accomplish much. We ask ourselves what our giving tells the world about our view of God. Is he a hard taskmaster, a celestial inland revenue agent? We want to make all the possible deductions before we hand over our dues. Or do we believe that he is a generous God? A God who's given us everything we have. We want to copy his generosity in our giving. These people gave generously. And they gave promptly. When they arrived, before they began to build their own houses, didn't hold on to their money as long as possible. Just give over what was left over when they'd met their own needs and wants. And the giving was spontaneous, it was voluntary. They offered freely for the house of God. It wasn't something imposed on them. It didn't have to be dragged out of them by sustained emotional appeals, pictures of starving orphans and the rest. And Paul tells the Corinthians, each one must give as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. Do you enjoy giving? <clears throat> Randy Alcorn writes, In my own experience, there's nothing more exhilarating than to participate in God's kingdom program by meeting the spiritual and physical needs of others. Nothing is so stimulating and rewarding as joining with brothers and sisters and the highest cause in the universe, bringing glory to God by extending his grace to others. When did you last think of using the word exhilarating to describe your giving? You're investing in eternity. And then fourthly, their giving was proportioned according to their ability. That, of course, was the nature of the Old Testament tithe, a tenth directly proportional to income. As Paul says, if there's first a willing mind, it's accepted according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Don't be ashamed if you can't give as much as other people. God can do great things even with small gifts. After all, he fed 5,000 men with one boy's picnic lunch. Don't be discouraged if you can't give as much as you would like to give. Time to be discouraged as if you don't want to give. So we've seen a couple of lessons here, haven't we? The variety of roles and gifts. 
the importance of giving. I've passed over a significant passage at the end of the list of names. Verses 59 to 63 tell of a problem that was encountered. Some of the people couldn't prove that they were true Israelites. Even some of those who thought they were priests couldn't prove their genealogy. Oh, why bother to mention that? Does it matter? Sure, they need all the help they can get on this massive building project. Well, yes, it does matter. And it particularly matters as it regards the priesthood. Number 1640 laid down that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord that he might not become like Korah and his companions, just as the Lord had said to him through Moses. And you may recall that story. Korah and his companions rebelled against Moses and Aaron, said, why do you exalt yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? And so Moses devised a test for them, <coughs> and for Aaron. He said, let each take his sense and put incense in it. Each of you bring his sense before the Lord. 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with his censer. So a man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And there was the test. There were these 250 people who were rebelling. And there was Aaron. And then fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Judgment was swift and deadly. This is not a trivial matter. Who's going to come into God's presence? Who's going to offer the incense? Who's going to act as a priest? So how do the Jews deal with the problem? The governor says to them, they should not eat of the most holy things till a priest could consult with the Urim and Thummim. Now it's not quite clear what the Urim and Thummim were. We learn from Exodus 28, they were put in Aaron's breastplate. I note in my New King James Version there says the names mean the lights and the perfections. The most common suggestion is that they were some kind of stones, each marked in some way with a yes and a no. So they'd be used rather like rolling two dice. If they both give the same result, that answers the question. If they give different answers, well that's no answer. It seems for some reason the ability to use them had been withdrawn. So there's no way to consult, no way to find out for sure whether these people should be priests. And so until that could be done, they were excluded from the priesthood. What we see here is a determination to obey God's word. There's a great concern for holiness, for obedience. It's not a nitpicking, we must obey the letter of the law attitude. It's motivated by a concern for the good of these people. If they're not priests and they draw near to God, then they could be struck dead by his holiness breaking out against them. So their exclusion is for their protection. And Stan Evers applies the principle to us. The purpose of the Mosaic law was to emphasise the point that a holy God demands holiness from those who offer him worship and profess to serve him. Just as the governor was concerned for the purity of the Jewish priesthood, so we are to be cautious about whom we allow into our pulpits and into the membership of our churches. We can only be effective in our witness to the world if we uphold the high standards which God has set for us in his word. We see in this passage a picture of what it looks like when God stirs the hearts of his people. Their great purpose is to restore the true worship of God. They're eager to play their part in that work, whether it's prominent or humble, whether they're in the spotlight or the shadows. They're cheerful, generous givers to God's work as their resources are allowed. Concerned for holiness, for obedience to God's word. And in these things, of course, they are pictures to us of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Israel in the Old Testament is described as the Son of God. As 
God said to a Pharaoh through Moses, let my son go that he may worship me. But the son failed. And so there was the captivity. The people come back. We see in this passage a great beginning, a desire to serve God. But as we read through, we see again failure. Then God's Son comes, the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect, the true Israelite, the one who perfectly embodies what they at this point demonstrate in part. Think of those four aspects I've just mentioned. There's worship. The temple's being rebuilt so that worship could be offered to God. And Jesus is our great high priest. There were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us. Who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And has become higher from the heaven than the heavens. Who does not need daily as those high priests. To offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins. <coughs> for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God cleanse your conscience from dead works. To serve the living God. Through Christ we can come into God's presence. We can worship him acceptably. You see worship. And then there's service. Even the son of man did not come to be served. But to serve and to give his life. A ransom for many. You know that story in John 13. How Jesus demonstrated that in practical action. When none of the disciples were willing to wash the smelly feet of the others. Jesus himself took the towel and the basin and washed their feet. His whole life was one of service. Doing whatever tasks were needed to fulfil his ministry. He didn't stand on his rights. He didn't say any work was beneath him. Hebrews 10, 7 applies the words of Psalm 42, Jesus. I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it has written of me, to do your will, O God. He delighted in service. And then third we saw generous, willing giving. Jesus didn't just give money. He gave himself. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. We know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you through his poverty might become rich. Finally there's holiness. Obedience to God. You could say of God, I always do those things that please him. And he took, said of him, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return, when he suffered he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. We see in Jesus the perfect embodiment of these principles. Do you want to worship God acceptably? Do you want to play your part in the life of the church? Do you want to be more consistent or generous in your Christian giving? Do you want to live a life of faithful obedience? Then look to Jesus. Think about his perfect example. Give yourself to the one who is willing to give himself for you. Those were some words from Bob File. <coughs> Being a minority, as we are today, places us where these returning exiles were. Like them, we need to be faithful in our time. 
believing that the promise is given to them and fulfilled when Christ came, have a yet more glorious fulfilment in the city where there is no temple, but where God and the Lamb reign. Most of our names, like most of theirs, are not household words, but are written in heaven. Living in the fallen world means we need to accept the limitations of our time and get on with it. At any stage of the story, God is building his temple and we need to carry out diligently the tasks at hand and depend on his faithfulness.